I tell you, this is such a pleasure uh, to welcome you in, to have you on, and to talk about what is it, just a, a tremendous book here. How's everything going? I know it's been a crazy time for you. The book came out on April 2nd. Now the audio book's coming out. This has got to be a crazy time, but it's got to be exciting for you as well. Absolutely, clean. Hello to you and to your audience, so listeners out there. And yes, it's a, it's an adventure now, you know, and you have a, as an artist, it doesn't matter if it's a book or a movie or in this case, book and audio book, once you go out with a project, you know, it's one thing, one struggle is to write it or to make it, and then the other struggle is to find a publisher or distributor, and then it comes a third struggle, which is a bigger struggle, to bring it to the audience. Yes, that is, that it seems to always be the kind of the second struggle after you've put your your created creativity and, and, and life into something, and, and this has come out and... Just kind of tell us a little bit about it, <clears throat> because this book uh, takes place sort of uh, during the Cold War um, in America. Uh, and, <clears throat> excuse me, you have sort of a unique perspective on this. Can, can you just take us back to some of the experiences you had? I know um, growing up, your father was also uh, a political prisoner, which is very unique and, and kind of added to this. Just kind of tell us about your personal connection and how this story was formulated. Absolutely. With great pleasure. Yes, this is, uh, you know, it's very strange, but uh, growing up, I never thought I'm a prisoner's son. But, you know, I always look at my father as uh, it's my dad, and, you know, it was a man that I admired so much. And and he's, he was, how can I describe him, kind of founding father material, you know, a philosopher, a uh, writer, and somebody with... Uh, it's like Ron Paul meets Dennis Kucinich. <laughs> I can describe him somewhere yeah. like that. It's just a you know, very principled human being, both on the left side and on the right side of the spectrum. And he was a dissident, and so he spent many, many years, 18 years he spent in KGB prisons and gulag camps. And somehow the Soviet government hasn't managed to break his spirit because this man has... Uh, boundless um, ideas and hope. And that's how I grew up in his family in Soviet Union in 70s and 80s. And by late 80s, when Gorbachev came to power, uh, you know something happened to him. Somehow uh, he lost hope. So he fell into this black hole and he got depressed because all his friends were dying and uh, dissident friends started rapidly dying one after another late 80s. And at the same time, he also came to the conclusion that some of those dissident movements were infiltrated by KGB informants. And then he gathered me and my brother, and we were young, I was uh, 22, my brother was like 16, and he said, listen, this country is a black hole, and it's eating its own people for decades now, and it's never going to change. And actually, the Ronald Reagan's uh, depiction of it as an evil empire is an absolutely accurate uh, depiction. It is an evil empire. And he said to me, uh, I want you to go to the United States, and I want the new generation to be born in freedom. But at the same time, he said to me, you have to keep on fighting over there because those forces are going to come now over there and they have targeted United States Constitution and Bill of Rights, which is the really the last bastion of liberty for everybody. And then he, he, he but I was very young, I was really not so much aware where this thing leading and uh, I was so busy saving him because he became sick. And I didn't understand all these uh, psychological nuances. And, and he unexpectedly, he committed suicide. Wow. And when he, obviously, when he committed suicide, our worlds went upside down. And this is something that probably I, for 10 years, believe it or not, Clint, for 10 years, it's uh, the rest of the family, it's me, my brother, and my mother. We could not remember, in between three of us, we could not come up with the same description of events. All of us were traumatized to such level. We, each of us has their own version, what happened at what time, how, and
and it's only recently, which is, he died in 1987, so it was like 32 years ago. Believe it or not, my mother is alive in L.A. We came to America in late 80s, and so she's 85 years old, and only now we piece the pieces together. And, and it's funny because it also happened after me writing this book, because this book... I was avoiding, I'm a filmmaker and an author, and I was trying to avoid this Russia thing, because unlike many West Europeans who are in America and they go back to France or Italy or Spain and they come back, and there's some sort of a mix and harmony in terms of culture between, because it's the same institutions and it's the same value system, but Eastern Europe, and especially when it comes to Russia, it, Russia prescribes to Eurasian value system. And Eurasian value system is not the Western value system. It's, it's a much bigger conversation. But anyway, there's just nowhere to go back. I didn't want to look back. But then I understood that for me to be able to move forward and to be a true artist and actually good, good father to my children, I have to set the record straight for myself and for my audience and people who were following my work. And, and I embarked on this journey of writing this story. And this, this story is about, uh, I mean, just plot-wise, it's about human rights lawyers who were late 80s, went to Gorbachev era Russia, trying to teach law meaning civil law, civil law, election law. This is actually based on, they were actually, truthfully, there were two American law firms who late 80s wanted to go in to help Russians to create new society because sure. they were tired of Cold War. See? Yeah. And then, of course, they went over there and they discovered that, oh my God, it's impossible to do anything here because population in 70 years of living in freedom, these people are scared to move. There's no concept of liberty. You see, there's no concept yeah. of what is a law-abiding society. So they came back pretty disappointed. And, and the rest of their lives, they were busy really saving those dissidents, people like my dad. And, and I thought that I have to write this story because then, then it's kind of comparative analysis also of both societies. And I wanted also for the American audience to have a glimpse into what's dissident. So what is it to have this alternative point of view? And especially these days, to be honest with you, this, this last maybe decade or something, I'm seeing the changes in American society and it alerts me. I get alarmed, you see? Yeah, understandably. And, yeah, and I'm like, okay, I guess th there's certain things, and it, when it comes to liberty, I mean, we need to talk about these things honestly. You know, it's it, because book, plot, this, plot, that, let's say if we bypass the regular Hollywood uh, pitch lines, which is basically just this plot versus that plot, for me, you know, this book is, is literally about deconstructing lies that, let's say, I've been fed since childhood uh, through family, through society, through government. And it's very important to have this honest conversation right now. And I try to expose the emotional world of these uh, characters and the ideology that they were believing uh, in. in. Honestly, so, so people who are reading it can understand the difference between collectivism and individualism. See what I mean? That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you because to me, um, as, I, as I look through this and I, I think about your story, um, I, I, the, the, the lead character, Vasya, uh, in the novel, I, you know, she's really modeled after your your courageous father, and, and you talked about being kind of traumatized from some of the events. Do you feel that writing this and doing this and using kind of her as a, as a vessel um, to express some of your father's, um, you know, troubles, do you think that was therapeutic for you in the end to do that? Yes, yes. Uh, for, for artists, any 
anytime you uh, write something or you make a movie or, or if it's if it's just honest cry of soul, it is therapeutic. And and uh, truth is yes, one of the lead characters is not the lead lead. The the main character of the book is the American human rights lawyer Luke Forsythe. But the lead character, who's the Russian dissident, the Vasya Verbitsky character, I really modeled it after my father. And that was, that was, because my father was a writer himself, and he wrote three novels, which were unpublished. They were kind of some is that bestsellers. But, you know, they were about his prison life, his prison time. And, and he, it, it was love stories written in prison. It was fascinating to see this man going after 17 years of uh, prisons. And, you know, he was tortured. When they say, you know, all this talk in the country when he was going about torture. I'm one of those people who hates torture. I'm so against torture because, you know, his fingernail was pulled out of in one of his fingers. And he was describing to me that it's the most horrendous, barbaric thing that has ever happened to him. Oh, God, yeah. You know, and, it, and, and the pain even, uh, it, it, I think they did it in mid-40s when, when he was in Gulag camps. And even in late 70s, he was still, that pain was still alive inside of him. That, that was incredible. So, but yes, it was very therapeutic, and it was actually... In a way, I felt that, you know, it was a way of connecting to his ideas because he had very unique ideas as a, as a philosopher, as a thinker. And I wanted to express those ideas. And one of them is a simple thoughts. For example, uh, an entire nation minus one person is not an entire nation. You know, yeah. they had to find their own footing, those people who were fighting for freedom. And now we're in a country, we're living in, in, in this, with good, bad, and ugly, United States is the most amazing country in the world. And we cannot let this country to go down. And this current very toxic environment between Republicans and Democrats are eroding all those principles of those founding fathers. Yes, I could not agree with you more there. Um, talk about the time period here, because you came to America in the late 80s, kind of in the midst of this, and obviously uh, we're talking about this time period being, you know, Reaganomics, Star Wars, the Cold War, obviously very prevalent. Um, how important was it for you and to, to that this be set sort of, uh, you know, during this time in, in the late 80s? And how important was that for you to make sure that was set I'd there? very important. Yeah. It. It's a very good question, Clint. Yes, it's, it's, it's actually at that moment where Soviet Union was collapsing. You see, when I was, at that time, late 80s, I remember when Gorbachev came to power, and it was kind of, the in the West, there was Gorbomania. Everybody was loving this guy, because they were thinking, oh my God, finally there is somebody who wants to change. He brought in Glasnost, Perestroika, so... You know, he was kind of hero. Hollywood celebrities were, you know, doing birthday parties for this kind of stuff. But for us, on the other side at that time, he was very much of a hated human being because we all knew it. This is a government apparatchik. This man never wanted to change this country. He actually was trying to preserve it the best he can so he can stay the general secretary. The country economically collapsed. There was no way to pull it off anymore. So in this fight between him and the KGB, the security apparatus of that country, the Praetorian Guard, so to speak, of Communist Party, there was conflict between these two. And basically KGB outmaneuvered him. And they took over the country. So there was not much love for Gorbachev. You understand? Coming to the United States, and that's a, that's a feeling it's undescribable when you have to experience prison, and then suddenly you taste liberty. Then you know, then you know why people are ready to die for liberty. You see, there is, people yeah. have to have point of reference. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's an unbelievable perspective for sure. And, uh, you know, I've got to talk to you about the audio book um, as well, Hamlet, because it came out on uh, April 30th. So just been a couple weeks now. And it's very different because uh, there's been there's an original score involved. There's sound effects, sound design that's been added. So it feels like you're almost listening to a movie. And the original score is written by none other than guitar legend Steve Hunter. Talk about that, how that came about. And how cool is that to have Steve Hunter composing music for this? It's, it's one of the most pleasurable aspects of this entire journey. I met Steve in the uh, mid-90s, in 1996, when I was hired as a director by Charlie Midnight, who was um, Charlie Midnight is a music producer, and he was producing a play called Cowboy Mouth. And it's a rock and roll play, which was written by Sam Shepard and Patti Smith. At that time, they had a director whom they fired, and they hired me to kind of fix the play. So I came on board, and David Boreanaz, who now is a very prominent TV actor, and he's the lead of the SEAL team now, you know, and it was David's first uh, role on that show. I casted him on the show. So when uh, Charlie Midnight asked me uh, what kind of music... uh, should we do it? And I said to him, listen, there are lyrics in this play, and it sounds like Lou Reed. And he said, oh, I know the guitar player of Lou Reed, <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to introduce him to you. And he lives here, actually, a couple of blocks from this theater. He lives in Beachwood Canyon, and at the theater complex was on Santa Monica. Here. And he said, so we're going to meet Steve Hunter. And it was it was an incredible uh, coincidence and good luck. And of course, when I met Steve, you're uh, it's, you're meeting an ultimate artist, a musician from head to toe. And Steve wrote a mesmerizing music for that play. I mean, it was uh, one of the best scores ever. And he has lost that score now. Because I've I've been chasing that score, but it's as usual. It's all those great artists, you know. At that time, nobody was archiving his material and stuff, so that phenomenal music got lost. So when this time around, I came up with this idea that these uh, audio books are very boring when just one guy for eight hours, this dry voice comes <laughs> over and just puts me to sleep. And I said, I cannot do that. I want to do something different, you know, something that will give cinematic experience, that you will emotionally get engaged to the story, so I needed music to be written to it. Steve came to my mind, and I because I remember the score that he, he did for Cowboy Mouth. So I ca- contacted Steve. Steve now lives in uh, in Spain with his uh, wife Karen. Uh, he lives in Spain, so I contacted him, and 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 he was very much interested in the idea. I I don't think it has ever been done before scoring music for a book. And then we started working on this. And, and of course, Steve Hunter wrote fantastic music score. I mean, it's just mess. It's a, it's, it's a hypnotic, and it's true for the story. It's, it's it's an atmosphere. It's an ambience with his guitar tone. You know, he's he's one of those guitar players has has a tone nobody knows where's that coming from. Neither he can really explain it to you. But it's somehow when his finger touched the guitar, it's just absolutely unique tone that comes out of this guitar. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's tr- truly adds so much to to the experience here, and I think that given the tone of the of the of the book and of the story, that it just is it, the ambience is incredible and. I tell you what. Um, before we let you go, we got to you know tell people how to get a hold of this. There's a website, loversinthefog.com. Um, I assume that the audiobook's available in all the uh, the main outlets, Amazon and, and things like that. How's the, what's the best way to, to get a hold of, of, of everything here? Uh, yes, uh, it's available everywhere, Clint. So audiobook is available on uh, Audible and on iTunes. Widely, so everybody can go to iTunes and in audiobook section. Flowers in the fog, they'll find it. And also, it's available on Amazon. Book also is on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's, it, you can't miss it. Anybody who just types flowers in the fog, it comes up. And I very much want the listeners, uh, whoever are music fans, and if they listen to this audiobook, 
I really would like to hear from them in the comment section because I very much like this exchange with the audience. And I believe Steve would want to hear it too, their ideas, because that's something unique we, we try to accomplish here. I think you've definitely accomplished that, Hamlet. I tell you, thanks for sharing your story and thanks for uh, having the creativity and the courage to, to put this down um, in, in printed word. It's amazing. I have the physical copy right here. We're going to give away a copy uh, on the show as well. So thank you so much for joining us and best of luck with this. And uh, just thanks for everything. And best of luck to you, my friend. We can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. It's me who has to thank you. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much.